I have the enormous pleasure to uh, present somebody who has not to be presented because he has been so present during his fellowship that comes to an end and we regret it a lot and uh, tears will spread over over the world uh, but you will come back we hope so and uh, your um, farewell address in a way will be your talk today uh, the talk is entitled Indigeneity and Indigenous Rights in Bali on the Cultural Translation of International Legal Norms. So, a lot of concepts that seem to be rather clear on the one hand, on the other side, what translation is, what culture is, has been the debate for centuries. Especially translation seems to become a new even a new paradigm after all the turns the translational translatio paradigm seems to become one of the most fashionable ones at the moment next uh, Thursday at the Max Planck Institute Peter Burke will talk about translation and so forth I could name a lot of events that are centered around translation but what is translation if not irritation if not transplantation if not implantation, if not implants, whether legal transplants are possible, whether translation is possible, whether there is something like translatability uh, at all. So, so many questions since hundreds of years and the topic comes back. How and why does it come back? It could be that it has to do with the fact that globality and globalization necessarily brings closer a different legal cultures as we like to say in our center and that interactions and I would prefer always to speak about interaction because the uh, repercussions are perhaps the most interesting things that uh, 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 play an enormous role when different legal cultures different legal normative orders come into touch we know it from legal history, of course, as a classical topic of uh, the reception process of Roman law. This has been reflected methodologically for really hundreds of years. Uh, but very seldom uh, the interaction were, were uh, also uh, um, brought into the focus of uh, our intention and this has to be uh, done uh, I think uh, much more. So I'm very happy that in our series very soon a new volume will come out about the reception of Roman law in the Asian <coughs> world, in China, Japan and that's an interesting because at first sight the tension seems to be so great but it's different. And uh, so you are in the midst of a very central topic of the global world. You are equipped with the knowledge of the ethnographer, with the ethnographic methods, with the ethnologists, uh, ethnologist and with the knowledge of the law. This is a very special situation and uh, uh, because if you are an uh, ethnologist you know you must have also a field without a field you are not an ethnologist you're just a theoretical uh, person perhaps a sociologist but not an ethnologist and uh, Indonesia is your field among others and also Indonesian uh, atmospheres and cultures in Europe for example if I understand right with all these capacities and abilities to talk about this uh, difficult topic that is ad uh, announced, uh, we should know uh, and read much better um, the fields where you have become during the last uh, uh, years uh, one of the first um, specialists in the world. A special issue, for example, of Journal of Legal Pluralism uh, about temporalities of law together with um, Kebet von Benda Beckmann and Melanie uh, Weiber. Um, uh, this uh, topic of law and temporality and time is also a classical one, but in the ethnological context it is so much the more interesting because time and space 
as a fundamental category analyzed by uh, Durkheim and Morse in the um, quelques formes primitives de classification remains one of the first orientation marks uh, when you deal with other cultures. The time concept of time and of space, but related to the law, it is fascinating. Religion in dispute, pervasiveness of religious normativity in disputing processes once again shows that uh, the topic of our second research here the relationship, namely the relationship of law and religion, it has always been in the, in the focus of your interests. Perhaps let me allow me to name uh, a third uh, publication about decentralization and regional autonomy in Indonesia, implementation and challenges, uh, co edited with uh, Cohen Holtz Appel in Singapore uh, in 2009. Hindu bonds, anthropology and the nation state, Hinduism in modern Indonesia, and so forth. And even I found a recent publication, no, it's not a recent, it's longer ago, more than 10 years ago, about Weltbild, Heizpragmatik und Herrschaftslegitimation im vorkolonialen Bali in times when Germans still wrote in German. Uh, it's long ago, and um, so uh, you will speak in English, but if we don't understand, please help us to follow up with your certainly very sophisticated, but in the same time always very lively presentation, and we are really eager to know more about your fascinating research topic. So please, uh, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for having been with us in such, you must know it, those who are not always with us in this circle, in such a wonderful, always generous way with having new literature and uh, new insights and inputs from ethnology so that we have to thank you very much for your presence during the whole stay of, of the fellowship. So once again, we listen to you. Thank you very, very much, Werner, for this very nice uh, um, introduction and uh, generous time that you, you allowed me here because, um, as you know, I really could develop my, uh, a new line of, uh, of investigation, of thinking, and this is condensed today in this, uh, in this talk, and um, it may be uh, it's also pleasant to know in terms of the outreach of, the, of this center that uh, I'm going to present uh, this topic also at a very specific expert uh, conference on legal translation mm -hmm. in, in, in Geneva in, uh, in June. I would have started if it had been technically possible uh, with, a, with a short ad um, uh, by a legal professional, a, a professional legal translator advertising in, in a wonderful, um, not Oxford English, but more um, uh, better selling, um, uh, more communicatable, uh, uh, middle class English accent, that uh, they are the experts in legal translation, that it's very easy, they, 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 they uh, can uh, um, translate concepts one to one and very accurately and so forth. So this is, of course, uh, the, um, a way to sell one's services, and it's, uh, as we are going to, uh, going to hear and experience, uh, very far from the reality. I don't know if you're familiar with Catherine Namak Namakula, a colleague from the Max Planck Institute in Freiburg, Völkerrecht, or Harry Englund, um, an, a social anthropologist who also working in the field of, uh, of uh, legal anthropology. Um, but they have pointed out uh, different fallacies of legal translation practices just on the level of linguistics. So just on the level of linguistics, there, there are already uh, um, uh, fallacies that, uh, that, uh, counter the, that are counter uh, examples of this easy selling assurance of this uh, legal translator service. Namakula has pointed to the incommensurability of categories, not only across languages, but also across legal systems. I mean, 
I don't, I don't think that I have to go very much into it. Civil law system is different from common law system, and if we come to, uh, for, uh, to Chinese law or, or mixtures of, of different systems together with, with uh, customary law um, influence, then it multiplies these incommensurability of categories due to different legal systems. Namakula also has pointed out the time pressure of uh, professional legal translators, for instance, at uh, criminal, international criminal uh, tribunals, that they really have to come up with quick, dis uh, with quick, quick translations in order to, to really be fitting into the, into the schedule of the, of the, of the sessions. Harry Englund also pointed to the divergent interests of uh, the different translators who uh, engage in legal translations, like NGO activists, or, or in indigenous lawyers, or commercial uh, lawyers for, for commercial firms, and so forth. And then, of course, which is often forgotten, and there are, there are a host of unqualified translators empl employed by NGOs and local governments, because they usually don't uh, pay so much attention, also the international donors don't, don't pay so much attention to the importance of <coughs> legal translation. And so you sometimes have school teachers, local school teachers, who, don't, who are in any, anything but uh, uh, experts in, in translation and so forth. Plus, uh, the, uh, as uh, Harry Englund also points out, that the vast majority of the population in African and Asian uh, countries depend on national um, and vernacular languages and don't have English uh, easily available. Also, translation in these countries tend to, to be top-down. They occur without, uh, without uh, consultation of, of the local population. And also, of course, um, interests might change also in the process of projects so that legal translations are started and then by someone and then ended by, by someone else. So that quite reductionist translations are often the case. Then there are, we, when we leave the level of linguistics, then we, we also reach, then we reach actually the level of, of the cultural, the different cultural dimensions of law. Of course, then that we could also, uh, f first of all, uh, refer to, uh, you, Werner, you pointed out different dimensions of the law. We, minimally, we could sum up symbolical, performative, and organizational dimensions. Then, of course, as uh, Sally Falk Moore on Pierre Bourdieu alerted us, in different ways that there are the rule generating institutions or the norm genera generating institutions in non-legal semi-autonomous fields that impact on the translation. For instance, uh, um, uh, ways of, uh, I mean, etiquette or uh, w um, familial rules in, in, in big clan organizations that might uh, impede or accelerate certain certain uh, interpretations. Um, this is brought home very much by, uh, uh, by an, a, New a case from New Zealand. Arno Turwai, for instance, um, argued that even when non-Western norms are accommodated and hence translated into Western legal systems, a mere textual translation has proven to be not enough. And he refers to the a Maori concept which, which uh, uh, means guardianship, but guardianship which you inherit as, as being part not only of a, of a descent group, but also as, as uh, being uh, in communication through the, your lineage with certain ancestral deities that actually give you the right to do so, and also to care for the, for the for the land in a, in, a, in a specific way, which is totally disregarded by the average judge who does not know about it, and also does not know about the conventions of interpretation, not about the indigenous in, uh, institutions connected to that, so that often, even though 
the, the concept, uh, I mean, New Zealand has gone very far in integrating um, uh, indigenous concepts into fishery, uh, fishery acts, for instance, or other, other legislation. Um, it often turns almost against the local traditions, the indigenous traditions, because they are so, so um, uh, corrupted. Then there are, are the pitfalls of legal comparison which aggra aggravate the translation of international law across cultures according to Günther Frankenbu Frankenberg. And I only want to uh, name some of his points which he, which he uh, uh, presented uh, in one of his lectures at the Max Planck Institute in Halle. He said that uh, usually international uh, uh, law creators, authors of international law, they, they have a lack of self-reflection, they, they, uh, they naturalize or normalize their own law or legal concepts. Often also they, they overestimate the influence of law and that, that, uh, it, 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 that they neglect the fact that it also needs to be enforced and that it needs to be accepted in, in heterogeneous locales. Also, uh, often they, as I al already mentioned, they, um, it is a more a top-down, non-dialogical conception of international law categories without consultation on the ground. And often international uh, legal scholars have a, have a, a um, universalist approach to law which has its advantages, but often it doesn't fit, uh, I mean, in, as, from an ethical point of view, one could debate Universalism via or uh, versus uh, particular particularism, but I think uh, one uh, empirically one has to state that the one key fits all locks approach doesn't work on the ground. And then, of course, there is the problem of strategic and selective comparison. Uh, for instance, even if they if they uh, envision the local situation in which an international concept is translated to, they often rely on indicators like failed state in the failed state index or, or, or the democracy index. So what we are in need of is, says Günther Frankenberg, and I would agree, what is needed is a thick comparison of plural legal realities. We have to deconstruct the baggage with which international law comes, namely the hegemonic grid of concepts, research techniques, professional ethics and politics. So we have to uh, pay particular attention to political implications and interests of the different actors on the different grids, uh, levels. So, also uh, an important point by Harry Englund, people claim or resist human rights in real life situations, especially uh, uh, human rights concepts are often so vast that uh, they, you really need to build conceptual bridges uh, to the real life situations on the ground. Also, local governments are highly selective with regard to human rights. For instance, in, in Indonesia, as we know, not the total human rights are, are, are uh, adopted, but uh, a catalog, catalog of certain human rights. So it has a different Indonesia has a different uh, different uh, uh, understanding of religious freedom, which is freedom to practice one's religion, but not freedom to change one's religion, one's religion or freedom from religion. That's not that's not in the <laughs> in the text there. So and he he poses two important questions to us: Who controls the translation at any point in time? And how does the political history of a country influence the translation that's, that gets adopted there? Throughout Asia Pacific, there are transnational activists, national elites, middle tiered educated uh, NGO leaders that translate human rights frameworks to fit into particular situations. What Sally Emery, a well known legal anthropologist, um, has learned during her fieldwork in different Asian countries uh, as to the translation, tr translation of gender rights and gender equality into different uh, legal systems. She says, even though international law programs are translated into new contexts and framed in culturally specific ways, 
they are never fully indigenized. They retain attention, and to her they should retain attention in order to transform the, the, legal, the local legal systems into the direction the norm leads. They retain their underlying emphasis on individual rights to protection of the body along with autonomy, choice and equality ideas embedded in the legal codes of the human rights system. And last but not least, we should also listen to Richard Rottenburg, who has a very, very uh, fine-grained understanding of uh, translation in order to then come up with, a, with an approach of my own. He says, in order for ideas to circulate from one social world to another, from one frame of reference to another, they must be adopted, appropriated, and altered. Ideas are evidently unable to, to go very far on their initial impulses with only the energy from their original frame of reference. To be transferred, they have to be transformed, that is, translated. And even more so, every act of translation is inevitably also an act of performative omission and addition. Otherwise, the translation chain would break. Every act of translation is thus also an act of creation, producing something that did not previously exist. That implies that translation is always, at the same time, transformation. That, that it's, it's an illusion to have a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, translation. So cultural translation emphasizes the navigation of various perceptions, values, norms, practices, and procedures, institutional frameworks, and interpretations between and across contexts, as well as across scales. Translation is thereby always a multi-layered interactive process of interpretation and negotiation of frames of reference and meanings. Legal norms travel from one legal system to another. In so doing, they are not only translated to, into another language, like language, but into other legal codes that have their own logical ordering, into other institutional frameworks, into other legal procedures and styles of performing at court. They are, in short, translated into other legal cultures. These different legal cultures are furthermore influenced, as I said, by the norm-generating institutions of a number of locale-specific, non-legal, semi-autonomous fields like politics, class etiquette, and so forth, custom. So cultural translation calls upon us to identify frames of references and events and their respective perceptions and ranks in the major discourses in, in the locale. Identify, we, are, we need to identify translators, these can be human and non-human, uh, actants, so-called actants, according to actor network theory, like what, what uh, media also bring to a certain translation, so certain for formats also impact on certain translations. Uh, we need to analyze power relations as processes of negotiating between different frames of references and among actors, and we need to analyze the translation chains, because usually it's not just one translation, but several different translations and retranslations, top-down, bottom-up, and negotiated between different uh, actors involved in the whole process. And the, I mean, uh, donor agencies, um, lawyers, activists, tran translators, and so forth. And as uh, um, already was said, indigenous rights as part of international law are subjected to the key norms of international law. I, I, I can't go very much into that here, but um, uh, international law is always predicated upon nation statehood and uh, development is prioritized and human rights. So also the uh, indigenous rights movement as part of international law, although it, it uh, has retranslated local concepts to a global level very much needs to accommodate this. So the uh, ILO Convention number 169 from 1989, which is the only international law um, supporting uh, indigenous rights, 
addresses states and uh, it also, it also uh, stipulates that rights of indigenous peoples uh, should, uh, should uh, include or sh uh, should uh, primarily also include education, work and appropriate working conditions. Here is the element of, of development. And also, of course, uh, the human rights for the indigenous peoples should be heeded. And, and then, of course, also indigenous peoples' right to cultural identity and institutions for self-governance, indigenous peoples' rights to forge, forge their own future, which already means that they also they should not be precluded from development, and so forth. I think by now, I hope by now you 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 are ready <laughs> for uh, for the for the ethnography and histor historiography because that should always be uh, uh, combined. Because if we want to walk through the translation changes, we need chains. We need both. In order to understand how indigeneity and indigenous rights have been translated to Indonesia in general and Bali in particular, we have to go back to uh, colonial, colon, colonial period. For the Dutch had been instrumental in shaping post-independence notions of these two concepts, not in a direct fashion as we will see, but also uh, in the pros uh, because of other factors. These notions have indeed framed the translation of the indigenous people's movement to present to present uh, day Indonesia to a significant extent. But first let's turn to the map. I hope. Ah, right. Uh, you can see this is this was the Netherlands Indies until uh, 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 around the 1920s. Um, and it actually uh, um, covers it actually covers the covered the, the territory of present day Indonesia almost. Could see that here, East Timor was not was not Dutch, <laughs> but this is just a minor. I mean, what we what you have to imagine uh, it is is uh, an archipelago stretching uh, around 5,000 kilometers uh, along the equator. It consists of more than 17,000 islands, 6,000 of, of of which are, are uh, permanently inhabited, um, according to the, the Indonesian father of Indonesian anthropology, Kuntara, Professor Kuntra Raningrat, uh, Indonesia had at, at his time 900, 930 different local cultures, uh, not as many, but a lot of <laughs> several hundred uh, ethnic groups, and 250 major languages and, and uh, as many dialects. So you can see it's very heterogeneous. Although the Dutch had first come to the archipelago in the, last, in the very last years of the 16th century, it was only since the beginning of the 19th century that they really set out to subjugate all the territories indicated in this map. I do not have the space here to go into why this was the case. Suffice, suffice it to say that it took them until 1910 to establish their dominion as represented here. That was from the 1920s. It took the Dutch fr uh, from 1849 to 1908 to subdue the nine different royal houses in Bali, a process that involved a number of massacres, of which I cannot speak here, but they, they even enraged uh, the, the Dutch, the Nederlanders at home. What is important to us is that the key, that they kept loyal members of these royal houses as leaders of their traditional realm, this system of indirect rule was marked by the fact, though, that they were not allowed to rule as rajas initially, and that many of their former authorities over their subjects were seriously curbed. At the same time, colonial officers trained as Indologen, as Indologists, as experts of the local culture, were projecting their categories into Balinese culture and society. What they actually did, these Indolo in Indologists, I argue that they actually created the, the, the category of Balinese, Hindu, Hindu Buddhist in influenced Balinese. Because actually, for s often for several generations, also other 
Asians uh, closely cohabitated with the Balinese. For instance, here we see image of Hadramis, uh, people from Yemen, Hadram Hadramaut, and or Chinese. And sometimes they were al also already integrated in the ritual exchange. I mean, in the, in the, the Balinese have uh, elaborate ritual ritual systems, and they were already integrated. So I mean that you can't say they were that they were really separated out. But the the Dutch they separ separated them out. Um, in the constitutional regulation from 1954 already, discriminating between the natives ruled by their native law, customary law, and uh, the foreign orientals who in private, what, what the Dutch defined as private law matters could you, were, were left to their own customary laws institutions, but in matters of commerce, and that was the point here, um, uh, had to adopt the European uh, law code, which seriously dis disadvantaged them, of course. Plus, the, the, the Chinese were regarded as such, uh, uh, um, uh, what is it, um, strong comp competitors that they also uh, had, to, had to be subjected to a pass and zoning system that several severely circumscribed the ambit of Chinese business ventures. And uh, um, in 1870, they also uh, enacted the so-called agrarian ordinance, which prohibited um, Chinese from buying land in Bali, also, but also in other, I mean, it was a little bit uh, different in other locales, but that also accounted in, that was also true in, in, in Java if I am right. So there was a, the, uh, an artificial distinction between foreign orientals on the one hand, especially Chinese, and the Balinese. At the same time, the, the uh, Indolohan, the, the Dutch scholars, they went, at first they started, I mean the Dutch, they, they started to, to conquer, sub, sub, subdue North Bali. And the, in, the Indolohan went to the mountain mountain villages which had never been really subdued by, by courts, by Balinese courts. And they said, oh, this is the true Bali here. We find actually the, the original indigenous uh, Balinese village community free from the foreign layer of, of Indianized uh, influence. Um, and this is actually the case for the whole of Bali. So they said, um, their competitors, the, 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 the royal courts, the former rulers of Bali, they were actually foreigners. We protect the true Bali, the indigenous Bali, and free them from the, from the yoke of the royal houses. So they also opened, they, they, they opened up schools, modern schools, and the Balinese, even the commoner, I mean, Bali at the, t at the time until today is classified in four different castes, Indian, Indian influence, ancient Indian influence, Brahmana, Satriya, Vesya, Sudra, in, in Balinese. Uh, but also the commoners, the Sudra, were also allowed, actually were even, even uh, selected to go to enter these schools initially. And so, what you had, of course, um, uh, influx of new ideas brought by mostly Javanese teachers. The teachers uh, um, came from Java, the most, uh, the most developed part of the colony, you could say, bringing ideas like modernity, but also democracy and nationalism, Indonesian nationalism. And some reform organizations developed in Bali who actually um, attacked the privileges of, of course, of the of the old aristocracy, the three upper castes who built, who formed the, the traditional aristocracy in Mali. And th this started in the 1920s, and they were increasingly uh, ele eloquent. Then, in other parts of the of, of Indonesia, in the in 1926 and, and 1927. 
there were com communist upheavals. One of the first commun communist upheavals in, 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 A uh, in Asia that shocked the, the, the Dutch, of course, and also, which this uh, 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 slide referred, refers to, in, uh, delegates, the, the leaders of different um, ethnic groups congregated in, in, in uh, Batavia, the, the capital of the colony, and all these leaders were Dutch educated. They, they congregated and defined themselves on a congress called uh, Sumpa Pamuda, still the, the oath of the young Indonesians on the 28th of October 1928 um, to, to envision, to formulate the, uh, the intention and the ground for a unified nation. They recognized, recognized one common homeland called Indonesia and not the Indies. Indonesia is, uh, goes back to uh, Bastian uh, in the 19th century, a German geographer. We don't have to go in, into that here, but they didn't want to be identified as Indies because that is Dutch. They recognized themselves as one nation on the basis of common experiences under colonial, colonialism as well as a way of life influenced by similar customary law traditions. Also, they recognized one common language, the Indonesian language, that was developing out of the earlier so-called trade Malay, which was used in the markets. These events caused the colonial administration to prohibit Javanese teachers staying or coming to Bali and Balinese to study in Java. At the same time, and this is important for us, it launched, the, the, the colonial administration launched uh, a massive re retraditionalization program called Balisering, Balinization, to make Bali Bali <laughs> again. Of course, this program uh, endorsed the study and documentation, and therefore also the research on classical, classical art forms and so forth. Museums were opened, archaeological excavations were, were, were uh, funded uh, already for other reasons which I can't go into here. Mission, missionary activities were forbidden and so forth. But um, uh, what it's important for us that it was actually the Balinese aristocrats that dominate, that, 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 that benefited from this program. Because soon the, the, um, the Dutch saw these are our, in, our partners in crime <laughs> almost, because the, the local aristoc aristocracy was wary towards the uh, Indonesian nationalist movements because it came from Java and they were, were fearful of Islamization. First of all, and of course, they were also uh, 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 wary to lose their privileges. So, the colonial administration recognized the courts as bulwarks against foreign ideas, such as communism and Indonesian nationalism, and gradually, gradually re-strengthened their position in Balinese society, also by law. In 19 in the 1990s, in the early 1930s, sorry, the heads of the Balinese royal families. Claimed, reclaimed the title, the, the title Raja. They wanted to be called kings again, which they got. And Balisering was completed when the former Balinese kingdoms were reinstated as autonomous kingdoms under the direct rule of the Rajas in 1938, shortly before the Japanese invasion. Of course, they had uh, Dutch advisors at their side, but the, uh, uh, important is that uh, they bec became partners in the in, in, in government. Japanese occupation uh, lasted from 40, 42 to 45. In, 40, in, in 1946 the Dutch came back from Australia and wanted to reclaim their colonies their colony and uh, but they met with, with staunch resistance Indonesian nationalist resistance in Sumatra and Java, but it was very comparatively easy to re retake eastern part of Indonesia. 
And so also on the international level, they played federalism against a unitarian state and made a Balinese king, here the Raja Chopodre Sukawati from Yanyar, uh, the president of their puppet state, East Indonesia, which uh, was only uh, this is this uh, debunked, you could say, in, in 1949. Now we come to the the time when um, Indonesia was finally recognized internationally as a unitary nation state, and let's see how uh, how we how how uh, indigeneity uh, played out then. The recognition, the international recognition of the independence of the unitary Indonesian na nation state was the final victory of the Indonesian nationalists over the Dutch who had advocated, as I said, a federal state in which the major ethnic groups would have enjoyed a considerable degree of autonomy. In order to fight the remnants of colonialism, the leaders of the new polity went about designing legal and political strategies to truly unify the country. And a major legal tool was the five principles, the so-called Panchasila, contained in the preamble of the Indonesian constitution. It, the letter was somewhat hastily written by the representatives of three of the three major uh, streams in the independence movements: the, the the representatives of political Islam, the secular nationalists of different ethnic backgrounds, and the communists and socialists. So, um, the constitutions and, and the, five, uh, the five principles contain elements, ideological elements of, uh, of um, uh, all, all of these. Of course, the, the heterogeneity of, of Indonesia was represented as, oh, sorry, as unity in diversity. And then first we have the Bo, which stands for that the Indonesians, that Indonesia is guided by the wisdom in common de uh, deliberation and representation. That refers to an idealized uh, situation of uh, customary law situation, where in many in many Indonesian villages, the, the elders gather, gathered and deliberated and then came to decisions. Then you have the tree which represents unity of the Indonesian state, the necklace, just and civilized humanity, the grain, social justice, and the five-pointed stars, five pointed stars was a major tool to reduce the heterogeneity of, uh, of, of uh, in Indonesian society because it stands for, the, uh, for just five religions recognized by the um, Indonesian state, Islam, Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, and Buddhism, nowadays also Confucianism, which we don't go into here much, but religion became uh, an oppo opposition to indigeneity because uh, it disregarded belief in local an in ancestors, in deified ancestors, in deities, and so forth. Then another attack on, uh, on the legal traditions in Bali. In 1953, I mean 1950, Bali, Bali was forcefully integrated into, into the unitary Indonesian state. In 1953, all the, the, the judicial institutions at the courts were, uh, were um, abolished and all the aristocrats were kicked out of, uh, of their positions in, in, in the civil service. So what we, have, what we lost then, or what was lost then, was the whole court tradition, the legal court tradition, and also uh, the, the literature on, I mean, it's not, the literature is not lost, it is still available in archives, but the, the, the validity of the legal sources was lost. The, 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 the India derived Dharma Sastra, Arta Sastra, Niti Sastra, and so forth. They didn't have any influence anymore. Until 1960s, the, the, until the 1960s and 
you could say even longer because uh, for, for, for reasons of delayed implementation and so forth uh, the, the village customary law and, and their institutions could continue but this village customary law was uh, rooted originally traditionally in a different cosmology in a magical cosmology where, where uh, basically one had to live according to the designs literally also the, the, ge the geo geo geometric designs of, um, of the ancestors which the ancestors had brought down to, to earth you could say now of course uh, this was delegitimized due to the, to, to the fact that you had to have you, you had to have a religion which uh, delegitimizes this magic and mysticism. Okay, in 1960, Sukarno launched a land reform as part of the National Judicial Unification Project. In, it involved a large-scale reallocation of land. This is Sukarno with a, what is it, a hue, no? Um, presenting himself as, a, as, a, as an Indonesian farmer because the land reform was actually uh, uh, in it paid lip service to to the uh, uh, customary law but it actually reinterpret reinterpreted the customary law in such a way that uh, it turned the village commons into registerable land that is into property Therefore, it dis disowned, you could say, the former owners of that land, the spirits, the, 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 the deities, and uh, ancestors, and so forth. And uh, this is real, because this is real until now. This is real in Africa, this is real in... I, I, I know it sounds a little bit far-fetched, but it is real. Also, this land reform um, uh, redistributed the land, and this, was, this led in Bali, as elsewhere to a great conflict between aristocrats again and commoners because uh, the commoners had worked large land holdings of the aristocracy and were now trying to disown the, uh, the aristocracy. The new order General Suharto put an end to, to it and uh, in 1965 and uh, started a purge of real and alleged communists. His regime was helped by religionists of all sorts, by Muslim um, militias, but also by Hindu Balinese militias and by Catholic militias. Um, and in Bali, um, it was mainly Hindu villagers killing over 50,000 so-called atheist demons causing the disorder of Balinese society. And if we <coughs> go back just here, I forgot to point out, this is the eruption of the uh, biggest volcano in Bali, in, which uh, devastated a uh, whole territory there in 1963. That, that was seen as an omen, a bad omen that, that uh, Sukarno, who was actually loved, uh, uh, was um, was getting too close to to communism, which at the time he he actually really did. So um, oh yeah, no, sorry. Like the Dutch Suharto, who in 1968 officially became Indonesia's new president successfully solicited, solicited the support of the traditional nobil nobility not only in Bali but also in other parts of Indonesia. He also he learned from the Dutch and also had his own retraditionalization policies by which they converted the Balinese arts, rituals and religion into cultural capital for cultural tour tourism which he promoted very forcefully in order to attract foreign currencies with which to balance the losses caused by the sinking oil price. Until the end of the 1980s, the majority of the Balinese leaders seemed happy with that. 
The government sponsored the revitalization of classical art forms, the construction of buildings in the traditional architectural style and so forth. But from the beginning of the 1990s onwards, the whole Suharto clan, the presidential clan, the Golden Family, became so greedy that they pushed tourism further and further, disowned, uh, disappropriated fishers and farmers in, in Bali, often without fair comp compensation, and often also uh, um, um, sold, sold licenses for, to, for large tourist resorts to foreign investors with no regard or no feeling for, uh, for Bali sentiments. So this is the famous Bali Nirvana Beach Resort. Here you can see this is a dinner table I'm, um, which allows an oblique view here on this temple, which is a, one of the sacred, most sacred temples in, in, in Bali. And also it's, it has a stage in the, in the, in the, in the hotel which, re, which really reminds us very closely of, of a Balinese temple. So it uses elements yeah, with which to attract tourists. So, the legitimate, legitimate basis for this large-scale disappropri disappropriation of land was again the 1960 land reform legislation. Balinese activist lawyers, for their part, began to discursively link the emerging Bali-wide protest to the Indi Indonesian indigenous people's movement. Already in other parts of Indonesia in the 1980s, in Kalimantan, uh, indigenous, pe indigenous people's movement have, had started against uh, the widespread selling of license, mining and logging license. This, this again, disappropriating uh, local communities. So the disappropriation of land the selling of concessions to foreign investors developing tourism in Bali, and the complete disregard of the Suharto regime for the rights and sentiments of the local popul population convinced Balinese active activists to take refuge or rec re recourse to the ILO Convention, the rhetoric of the ILO Convention of uh, 1989. Things were aggravated by when, uh, by the fact that, that uh, I mean, things were aggravated for the Balinese by the fact that um, Suharto suddenly in 1989 uh, made a 180 degree turn, formerly he had uh, repressed Islam, now he, he, he staged his um, Islamic identity uh, with a public performance to, uh, of the Hajj and all also, which is most important for us, with legislation, with, with certain legislation. Legislation that all of a sudden uh, uh, advantaged, gave advantage, gave benefit to the Islamic um, educational system, the institutions, and uh, which received sponsorship in terms of uh, quali qualitative recognition, but also in terms of fi funding. Whereas the others, for instance, the Hindu colleges were, were totally without, uh, uh, without um, sponsorship and so forth. And also due to the fact that um, certain uh, modernist uh, notions of uh, Islam uh, were pushed by Habibi, a, a very close uh, uh, confidant, vice, vice president of, of, of uh, 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 Suharto, um, modernist Muslims came in key positions in the civil service. La uh, last but not least, um, vi uh, yeah, violence broke out, still obliquely, against Hindus who were not really, were actually animists, were not really religious people, and so forth. So in Bali, the the uh, the native sentiments um, con uh, converged with um, anti-Islamic sentiments. They converged into a religious ethnic identity, Hindu Balinese, 
which was then um, uh, promoted by a certain alliance of Balinese lawyers, businessmen, and so forth, uh, to actually um, erect a Hindu zone. Bali should become a Hindu zone. Then, of course, uh, the Asia crisis uh, uh, and, and also the uh, various student protests forced Suharto to step down as president in May 1998, and uh, interim uh, President Habibi took over and um, launched a far reaching decentralization proce process with the issuance of two new national laws on regional autonomy, which were enacted by the following legislatures of Abdurrahman White and Megawati Sukarno Putri. But we know that this time of transition between 1999 and, 19, uh, and 2002 uh, resulted in many inter-religious and inter-ethnic uh, uh, clashes. I just briefly point to the uh, anti sino Indonesian programs and also to the fact that uh, it wasn't only the Muslims who were uh, forcefully religious, but also in Papua, for instance, or in Eastern Indonesia, uh, states of, of Jesus were very in reality in, in, in Manokwari, a, a town in Papua, uh, that was also declared an, an evangelical town. In this spirit, in the midst of this heat, heated at, at atmosphere, delegates of different ethnic groups, including the Balinese, congregated in Jakarta to form the alliance of customary law communities in the archipelago, called Aman. Um, it is noteworthy that the highly educated activist leaders of this alliance translated the Indonesian name into English as Alliance of the Indigenous Peoples of the Archipelago, um, uh, which was forbidden in, in the Indonesian context. There is no, I mean, it is forbidden because uh, the Indone Indonesian government uh, argues that all Indonesians are indigenous. There are no indigenous peoples. And uh, Aman soon developed relations with the Asia Indonesian Peoples Pact, the Indig Indigenous Peoples Caucus, and other high profile institutions. It can be counted among the successes of Aman that Indonesia ratified the UN Conventions on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2007, albeit with a proviso that it does not recognize the term indigenous peoples for the Indonesian context. Uh, context. Now, now, I hope you bear with me another seven minutes. In 2001, Aman opened an office in Bali and its head representative began to call for bottom-up customary law courts, applying the notion of customary law communities that make sense. Appl applying the notion of indigeneity, it jarred with the fact that the legal tradition at the pre-colonial Balinese royal courts could arguably be called indigenous too. Why were they not indigenous? That was, that was a, a, a Dutch construction to call them that oh, this is foreign Indian, in, Indianized, which happened a thousand years before. <laughs> so, uh, but the judicial traditions of the Balinese royal courts was completely overlooked, which attests to the continuous power of the Indonesian nationalist notions of customary law communities who banned all heritage of the, of the aristocrats in Bali who were against the independence movement. movement. Right, calls for turning Bali into a Hindu zone were supported in, in a sense by the, by the representative of Amman in, 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 uh, in Bali who called for these, these courts and the two discursive strands converged in the decision of the parliament of Bali province in 2001 to legally endow local Balinese village communities with a significant degree of legislative, adjudicative, fiscal and administrative authority on the basis of local customary law, which was then uh, implemented three years later. And in the meantime, the, the leaders of the, of the different villages were, were uh, called upon to write down village village constitutions. They, I mean, they sometimes had texts, but they never were really written down like constitutions. 
So uh, here the, the Balinese specialists, they, they, they um, enacted uh, training seminars for customary law experts in the village and leaders so that they could come up with a with, with the village constitution. Also they said, said uh, there should be election, an election of village leadership. So formally the village leaders were, were appointed because they were part of a certain lineage or the, uh, the, the ancestors had given a sign in communal trance rituals or in dreams. Nowadays uh, the election of, uh, of the leaders, um, or of the candidates, uh, depends on their sufficiently high formal education and their man management capacities. Then, for the first time, there are uh, salaried village security forces who are actually armed. Uh, who, you could see if you look closely. This is this is a dagger, a ritual dagger, but it's it can it could kill. Um, the thing is that um, the mandate of the of these security forces is not only is is to um, prevent disorder and guard the is the order of the seen and the unseen world. So who can prove when the disorder in the unseen world? So that opened up leeway for, 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 for co really corruption and, and misinterpretation, which turned against um, uh, different local, local residents. So the authority is almost magical, although actually uh, it, it is derived by magical power from the unseen world, whereas actually they are truly legitimated only by, by Indonesian state law. It is also noteworthy that all these um, uh, villages were called upon to create, to set up village credit institutions, and you could see that they are not, this is not necessarily something which is uh, run down, it is really quite something sometimes. Uh, they, um, they, uh, in these institutions, the fiscal, fiscal contributions from the residents are managed, but also uh, the, the profit from communally owned business like uh, community owned restaurants or, or gasoline stations or so are, 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 um, are managed. And local residents can, can, uh, can uh, ask for loans provided they get it the, 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 from, from the management, that they can convince the management. Now I come to, come to the last and most important point that actually local citizenship is not congruent with local resi residency because uh, the, the regional regulation which um, said that, uh, uh, that gave autonomy to, this, uh, to these villages stipulates that uh, the so-called three causes of well-being, three hitakarana, are the foundation for, for local citizenship. It is slightly complicated, I try to, to do boil it down on, on, on the following. Uh, the, these villages are defined by three temples, an ori origin temple, uh, a, a deaf temple, and a community temple. And the origin temple is the most important. You should at least be an, an, a, a descendant of the ancestors revered there. And in order to be a local citizen, you need to take also part, you need to, to be, you have that descent, and you also need to regularly participate in these rituals. You have full citizenship when you really uh, prepare and, and, and perform these communal rituals, which are costly in, ter in terms of time and money, really costly, really costly. Which means that Balinese, even Hindu Balinese, who have ancestors revered in another temple, in, in another village, are not part of local citizens. Also, Balinese who converted to, to Christianity, for instance, or, or Buddhists, are not local citizens. They cannot decide. They, they are called upon to, to contribute, even no matter if they, if they are not uh, Hindu Balinese, they are contributed, forced to, 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 to sponsor, to, to give some funding to the, to the uh, village rituals. And, of course, it is totally against the, the Muslim migrants and, and Catholic uh, migrants in Flores, mostly, uh, they are um, t 
totally uh, disenfranchised, you could say. This is, uh, so there's a, a concept of indigeneity which is so local that it goes against the, 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 under, the, the common understanding of, of the whole thing. Then also, the, uh, as Rosemary Cohn wrote in a recent article, Asian pitches for UNESCO World Heritage or Intangible Heritage or Cultural Landscape listings are often supported by anthropologists influenced by the indigenous people's movement. This, this, the same holds true for Bali. This, ally, this, this alliance of, of people uh, were academically supported by the American anthropologist, uh, anthropologist Stephen Lansing working on rice cultivation in Bali and they, they, in 2012 they succeeded in, in um, getting a uh, cultural landscape of Bali province listed the Subak system as a manifestation of the tree Hitakarana. So what we actually have here is that uh, these, this, this conceptual ground for in inequality, for severe inequality was internationally recognized in the name of indigeneity, you could say. So to, to sum up, uh, transfer, what kind of transformation of indigenous rights in, in the Balinese context have we observed? There were the transformation of the legitimation of customary, customary law as major source of local law on the village level. It is not cosmo cosmology based anymore, but based on Indonesian state law. Then the, as to the legitimation of the village leaders, education and financial know-how is now important instead of lineage, vote of the ancestors and so forth. Also what has occurred, a fixation of geograph geographical boundaries which separate the different communities formally, they could vary according to the perceived power of the, of the, of the uh, ancestors at a certain point in time, so you could negotiate. Now the fixation of, of boundaries between uh, villages has led to many inter-village conflicts. Of course, and the modern temporal regimes have been introduced. I can't go into that here now. And of course, uh, there has, a, has been a highly discriminative rigidification in who constitutes a local citizen. I should probably close by, the indi by indicating what the concept of cultural translation did here for me. I have identified different frames of reference colonial orientalists, colonial retraditionalists, Balinese conservatives, Indonesian nationalists, and so forth, across which the concepts of indigeneity and indigenous rights have traveled. I have pointed to important events that have triggered certain cultural translation and retranslations of indigeneity and indigenous rights, colonization, independence, de decentralization. I have identified different translators colonial Indologists, the fathers of the Indonesian constitution, Aman activists, Balinese activists and lawyers, who have moved between the different fra frames analyzing their interests, performances and roles. I have paid attention to the different power relations impacting on the negotiations between different frames of references and among actors. And I have analyzed important translation chains, employing a distinctly historiographical approach. The end result, the book which needs to result from that, is what Theo Hermans has called thick translation, which is of course a variation on Clifford Gates' thick description. In any case, it takes into account a number of different contexts and frames, condensing them into something that must by, necess by necessity be called the researcher's fragmented, discontinuous interpretation. Thank you.